Welcome to the very first video of the Edinburgh Guide to the PSA. This video will focus on Section 1, Prescribing. As a brief overview, this section expects you to prescribe the most suitable medication for the patient, including its name, dose, route and frequency. You should base your choice of prescription on the clinical background, investigation findings and any contraindications or cautions that should be adhered to. In this section, each item is comprised of three sections, a clinical scenario, a prescribing request and a prescription entry box. The clinical scenario will likely be relatively long in comparison to other sections, so don't let this startle you. It will contain all of the information you need to answer the question. The history, examination and any investigation findings should give you a clear idea of the diagnosis, or if you're lucky, it may even be mentioned in the stem of the question. The prescribing request is the question actually being asked of you, so it is important to read this thoroughly as it will contain the specific indication for the prescription. Finally, there is the prescription entry box, where you will write in your answer, including the name, dose, route and frequency of the drug you wish to prescribe. The answer will be written as if you are writing an actual prescription, but for most items, the date and signature will already be filled out. Within the PSA, this section is worth a grand total of 80 marks. This accounts for 40% of the overall marks available, and so you should expect to spend a significant proportion of your time on these eight items. Don't worry if you feel like they're taking a while, because other sections will be much quicker to answer. 10 marks are allocated to each item, with five marks given for the correct drug name, and the other five marks given for the correct combination of the dose, route, and frequency. There may be more than one suitable drug to use, and therefore there may be more than one correct answer. However, you may select a drug that can be prescribed for the indication, but that may not be the most appropriate or suitable due to the patient factors or adverse effects of these drugs. In these cases, you will only receive three marks for your drug choice and a maximum of another three marks for the optimal combination of the rest of the prescription. This section may ask you to write hospital once only prescriptions, hospital regular prescriptions, GP prescriptions, or fluid prescriptions. The question itself will specify the type of prescription you are to write. The core content typically assessed includes the management of acute pain, anaphylaxis, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, depression, and thromboprophylaxis as well as the fluids for rehydration and maintenance. So, now that the basics of this section have been covered, let's place this into context by walking through some questions. So, question one. This is a 65-year-old man who presents to A&E with sudden onset breathlessness, pleuritic chest pain, and occasional hemoptysis over the last 24 hours. He has recently returned from a holiday to Japan he has no past medical history of note and is not on any medications. His mother died of a heart attack. He drinks 20 units of alcohol each week and smokes 25 cigarettes per day. On examination, he is pale and distressed. Of note, he is tachycardic, hypotensive, tachypneic and hypoxic. His apex beat is laterally displaced and the heart sounds are present. His respiratory, abdominal and neurological examinations are all normal. However, his right calf is erythematous, swollen and warm. He weighs 81 kilograms and has a BMI of 26.4. He has an elevated D-dimer. His ECG shows sinus tachycardia and a CTPA indicates a large saddle pulmonary embolus. His other investigations are all normal, including his coagulation panel. So, looking at the prescribing request, it is asking you to write a prescription for one drug that is most appropriate to treat this patient's pulmonary embolism. Now would be a good time to pause the video and to come up with your own answer. Hopefully you now have an answer, so let's see how you got on. So, 
This question focuses on the treatment of a pulmonary embolism. If we look at the clinical presentation, the key aspects for you to pick up on are that this is a 65-year-old man who has had classical symptoms of a PE and has recently been on a long-haul flight, which although not a major risk factor for a PE, is still important to consider. From the examination and investigations, it is important to note that the patient is hemodynamically unstable with a laterally displaced apex beat, suggesting a large PE that may be causing right ventricular hypertrophy. This is further confirmed from the CTPA and there is also a possible source for this PE, as shown by his clinical signs of a deep vein thrombosis. Moreover, he also has an elevated D-dimer, suggesting the presence of a clot. So, if we start to think of our answers, we would have to consider the treatment of a confirmed PE. The mainstay of treatment would either be anticoagulation or thrombolysis. It is important to consider if the patient has any contraindications to either of these treatments, such as an inherited bleeding condition or any altered coagulation panel results. In this case, there is nothing mentioned in the history that would contraindicate any thrombolysis or anticoagulation, and his coagulation panel results are normal, suggesting that both treatments are still suitable options. However, in this case, the patient is hemodynamically unstable and has a large saddle embolus. These are both factors that would indicate the use of thrombolysis. However, acceptable answers that would score full marks for this prescription would be unfractionated heparin via IV injection and thrombolytics such as alteplase, streptokinase or urokinase. Unfractionated heparin is the anticoagulant of choice due to its short half-life, the ease of monitoring and the fact that it can be readily reversed by protamine. NICE guidelines suggest that it should be offered in all of those with a PE and hemodynamic instability. It is also important to remember that the decision to thrombolize should always be discussed with a registrar or consultant. Suitable doses and routes for all correct medications are shown on screen, along with the marks that they would receive. I hope that this has all made sense and it highlights that there are usually multiple correct answers, but in order to get the full 10 marks, you need to have the correct drug name, dose, route and frequency. So. Now let's move on to question two. This is a 91 year old woman who has been admitted to care of the elderly for treatment of a suspected UTI. You've been asked to prescribe maintenance fluids because she currently has poor oral intake due to intercurrent illness. She weighs 58 kilograms and has a history of Alzheimer's disease, stage three chronic kidney disease and atrial fibrillation. She takes the medications Dinepazil, Digoxin and Rivaroxaban. On examination, she has a normal temperature, a heart rate of 82, and a blood pressure of 132 over 78. Her respiratory rate is 15, and her oxygen saturation is 97% on room air. On examination, there is suprapubic tenderness, and her capillary refill time is under two seconds. Investigations found her to have a normal sodium and potassium, but she has a raised creatinine and urea, and a reduced EGFR. If we now look at the prescribing request, it is asking you to write a prescription for one bag of fluid that would be most appropriate for this lady's maintenance therapy. So it's now time again to pause here and consider your answer. Now that you have considered your answer, let's go through the question. This question tests your knowledge on the prescription of maintenance fluids, particularly in the presence of renal impairment. If we look at the clinical presentation, the key aspects to pick up on are that this patient is 91 years old, has renal impairment, and has poor oral intake. There are no signs that she's experiencing hypovolemia or electrolyte imbalances, and we are told that she weighs 58 kilograms. This patient is unable to hydrate herself, and therefore she will need short-term maintenance of water, electrolytes, and nutrition. Having been unwell for some time, this patient may be fluid depleted to some degree, and therefore sodium chloride should be a major component of the initial IV fluid treatment to maintain her extracellular volume and make up for any acquired deficit she may have. The initial fluids should also include potassium, with daily requirements being one millimole per kilogram per day. 
the patient will also require some nutritional support in the form of glucose. Thus, sodium chloride or potassium chloride alone are not acceptable, as this patient requires fluids to correct any possible electrolyte imbalances and nutritional support. So, let's consider which fluid to use. When prescribing maintenance therapy alone, NICE recommends that you consider using 20 to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day of sodium chloride 0.18% in 4% glucose with 27 millimoles per litre of potassium in one day. In young healthy individuals, this would be 25 to 30 mils per kilogram per day, but NICE recommends reducing the amount of fluid in those with advanced age or renal impairment, such as in this case. So now that we have chosen the fluid we wish to use, we now need to calculate the volume we require. And this is done by multiplying the fluid maintenance dose with the patient's weight, which in this case is 20 times 58, giving us 1,160 millilitres. Since this is the fluid needed for a day, and we are only prescribing one bag, this means that we can either use 500 millilitres or 1,000 millilitre bags. The route will be IV as we are prescribing fluids, and she has poor oral intake. The rate of infusion is slowed due to the patient's age, and therefore, for 500 millilitres, it will be given over four to six hours, and for 1,000 millilitres, it will be given over eight to 12 hours. Fingers crossed that this has clarified this question and shows that you should focus on all aspects of the clinical presentation to find the most appropriate fluid choice. Now let's move on to our final question. This is a 57-year-old Afro-Caribbean man who attended his yearly screening appointment at his GP. He was found to have a blood pressure of 147 over 92, and this was confirmed as hypertension by subsequent ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. His past medical history includes type 2 diabetes, for which he takes metformin. He has no known allergies, drinks 10 units of alcohol each week, and smokes 30 cigarettes a day. There is not much to note on examination, with a normal temperature, a heart rate of 75, and a non-elevated JVP. His respiratory rate is 15, and his oxygen saturations are 98% on room air. However, he does have a raised blood pressure of 147 over 92. His peripheries are warm and well perfused, and his apex beat was located within normal boundaries. Heart sounds were all normal, and his breathing was vesicular. His abdominal and neurological examinations were normal, and he weighs 83 kilograms, with a BMI of 26.1. Investigations found him to have normal U and E's, and his ECG showed sinus rhythm. Upon ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, he was found to have a raised average blood pressure of 151 over 96. So, if we now look at the prescribing request again, it is asking you to write a prescription for one drug most appropriate for treating this patient's hypertension. Once again, you should pause here to think of your answer. Now, let's walk through the question and compare your answer to ours. This question focuses on the treatment of hypertension. If we look at the clinical presentation, the key aspects to pick up on are that this is a 54-year-old Afro-Caribbean man who suffers from type 2 diabetes. If we then focus on the blood pressure readings, this man would be classified as having stage 2 hypertension, which means that he should be treated with antihypertensives. If we initially concentrate on the patient demographics, this patient should be prescribed a calcium channel blocker due to his age and ethnicity. However, NICE guidelines suggest that any type 2 diabetic, regardless of their age or ethnic origin, should be given an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker as the first line treatment for their hypertension. Thus, acceptable answers for this question that would all receive full marks include ramipril, lisinopril, enalopril, losartan or candesartan. The correct initial starting doses from the BNF should be what is entered into the dosage, as this is only altered afterwards, but as the initial prescriber, these are the doses that you will begin with. All of the drugs are administered orally and taken once daily. 
For this question, these would be the only acceptable answers, as the man is a type 2 diabetic, so marks would not be given for any calcium channel blocker prescribed. All correct answers, their doses, routes and frequencies are shown here on our answer slide. Hopefully that's clear and has emphasised that you should focus on all aspects of the clinical presentation to find the most appropriate drug choice. So, I hope you've enjoyed this video as part of our Edinburgh Guide to the PSA series. For further study resources, please visit our website. If you have any queries about anything that's been covered in this video, please contact our team via email or Facebook. And if you have a minute to spare, we would love it if you could complete the feedback form linked below in the description. We look forward to seeing you in our next video, Section 2, Prescription Review. Ha, ha.